What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at S3 buckets in AWS. Now, S3 buckets are super flexible ways of storing your data within AWS, and they kind of connect to all the other data aspects of AWS as well. So if you have data sitting in an S3 bucket, you can connect it to a SQL database, you can connect it to a data visualization tool, or an ETL tool, or a ton of other things. So we're gonna be diving into how to set up your S3 bucket, how you can actually use it, we're gonna upload some data, and we'll talk about little tips and little nuances of using S3 buckets that I've learned over the years. So with that being said, let's jump onto my screen and take a look. All right, so let's get started by coming into our services. We're gonna go down to storage, and we're gonna click on S3. Now you'll notice we have S3 Glacier over here, and I'll briefly mention this uh, a little bit in this video because it is worth noting, but let's come over here to S3. So this is kind of the homepage for Amazon S3. We're gonna take a look at a few things in here really quickly. They do have this little video here, which if you're just using S3, you should look at. Now you may be wondering, what does S3 stand for? It stands for Simple Storage Service. It's meant to be a really simple way to store just about anything in the cloud. You can store essentially any type of file, whether it's structured, semi-structured, unstructured, it could be almost anything. And so let's take a look at some of the things in here. It says store and retrieve any amount of data from any where Amazon S3 is an object storage service that offers industry leading scalability, data availability, security, and performance. Now let's come down here and take a look at some of the benefits and features. You can read through all of these things and they're all really good. I'll read through this one in a little bit, but it says data performance and durability, security compliance and auditing, granular data control, and flexible storage options. So right down here it says save cost without sacrificing performance. Store data across a wide range of cost-effective storage classes and support different data access levels that are all designed for specific use cases. Now in this lesson, we're gonna be taking a look at some of this, which is their storage classes, because these are quite important important and they do affect the cost that it's going to take in order to store your data because uh, it's not free. Uh, storing your data in the cloud is not free. You can also look at some of their use cases as well as some of their case studies if you would like. Now let's actually get into it. We're going to come in here and we're going to create our very first S3 bucket. So I'll click on create bucket. The first thing that we need to do is do some of our general configuration. We're going to keep this a general purpose and we need to give it a name. So I'm just going to call this one Alex the analyst bucket. And if we had a pre-existing bucket, we've already configured it with uh, different configurations, we can just select that bucket and it'll copy over all the uh, things that we want. The next thing we need to do is you need to come right down here for object ownership. You can have ACLs disabled or ACLs enabled. If we go with the recommended route, it means that all the objects in this bucket are owned by this account, your account that you created. But if you do it where it's enabled, it says objects in this bucket can be owned by other AWS accounts. So with this one, it's just a little bit more secure because you're not saying other people can own it, which means they can delete it or change it in any way. Next, we're gonna come down here to block public access for this bucket. Now, this part is actually very interesting because I've had a lot of use cases where you just want to block all public access, but if you start really getting into AWS and you start using a bunch of different tools and things, sometimes you need to get rid of it um, and you need to come in and not only that, there's much more advanced things in order to grant different bucket policies or create different bucket policies. And um, we most likely won't get into all that in this lesson, but it can get quite advanced. And so this piece is pretty deceivingly simple, um, but we're just gonna keep it as we block all public access. But as you uh, start opening it up to different services within AWS, you may want to turn this off so that you can have different services hitting off of your S3 bucket or the data within your S3 bucket. So we're just gonna keep this as uh, all public access off. I'm just giving you lots of extra information while we're in here, uh, some of my thoughts. Next, we're gonna do bucket versioning. We don't need to have any type of versioning or version control within our bucket. What this means is keeping multiple variants of an object in the same bucket. It's used to preserve, retrieve, and restore every version of every object stored in your S3 bucket. And that is, of course, gonna cost a little bit extra, so we don't uh, need that at all. Next, you can add tags, and tags are helpful if you have a lot of different buckets, and you maybe it's per client, you have some type of tag for a specific client, perfectly normal. Uh, next, we have default encryption. Now, encryption in general is really interesting within the cloud. I've run into lots of use cases where it's been really difficult to work with. If you want to pull data into certain services, you have to decrypt it, 
uh, because you've encrypted it in one area. And so if it's in the S3 bucket and it's encrypted, uh, especially with kind of more advanced options, it can be somewhat difficult. And so just something to take into consideration if you want to kind of up your encryption. But for most use cases, you're just going to use the server side encryption with Amazon S3 managed keys with the bucket key enabled. Next, let's come down here to advanced settings. There's only one thing in here that we need to look at, which is the object lock. And remember, everything that you put inside of an S3 bucket is an object. Now, if we just read this right here, it says storage objects use a write once, read many, which is a worm model. And this helps prevent objects from being deleted or overwritten for a fixed amount of time or indefinitely. So if you want to drop a file in there and you know you're going to need it, you don't want it to be deleted for any amount of time, you can lock that and you can have an object lock on that object. It can never be deleted. We, of course, do not need that, so we're going to keep that disabled. And now we're ready to create our very first bucket. I clicked on Create Bucket. Uh, looks like we can't use uppercase, and I actually knew that. Uh, let's fix this. Now, this does have to be unique. This is global. So it says right here, you have to use a unique name. You can't just use, like, Alex. Uh, someone's probably already chosen that. Let's go ahead and create our bucket. And now you can see right in here, we have our very first bucket. Very exciting. Let's click into our first bucket, our only bucket. Let's go ahead and click into here. And we have a few different things in here. We have our objects, and that's gonna be any files that we upload into this bucket. And within this, we can create tons of folders and subfolders and sub subfolders and all these different things. We also have properties. So this gives you a little bit of information on how you actually created this. You have permissions, so if you want to grant uh, access to it. I talked a little bit about this, which is a bucket policy. So if we turn off this all public access and we turn on this or we allow this bucket policy, we can create our own bucket policy and that's written in JSON. And we can create our own bucket policy for public access to this specific bucket. That gets a little bit more advanced, but it is really fun. I've uh, done that quite a bit. You have metrics on this bucket. You can manage this bucket and you can create access points to this bucket. So there's a lot of things just within a single S3 bucket that you can do. But the most popular one that you're going to be using is this one right here, which is just adding, creating and deleting and using objects in general. So let's go ahead and upload our very first file. We're gonna go over here to add files, but you could add a folder if you have a whole folder, but we're just gonna add one file. And within my sample files here, we have a bunch of very real healthcare data. It's not real, uh, it's just completely fake data. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna upload one, then we're gonna come back and we're gonna upload another one in a different way, and I'm gonna demonstrate that and uh, explain that in a little bit. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna select this file, we're going to open this up, and now we have this real healthcare data onecsv and that's what we're gonna be uploading. Now, let's come down here. We have our destination. This is telling us where we're actually placing this. We have our permissions. And of course, we have a bucket enforced. And so if we wanted to grant access to other accounts, we need to change some of our access policies. But lastly, we have properties. And this piece is really interesting. This is our storage class. This is how uh, Amazon S3 is actually going to store your data. Now, I highly recommend going in to learn more and looking at their Amazon S3 pricing because it's very fascinating how they do this. Um, and it's also really important that you understand the differences between these different options that we have. By default, we have standard and it's designed for frequently accessed data within milliseconds for access. So if you're going to be using this data, you're going to be hitting off of it for different applications, services, uh, visualizations, whatever you're using it for. You're going to want to be able to access that pretty quickly. And so this is a great option. If you need it even faster, you have S3 Express One Zone, which is single digit millisecond response times for the most frequent access data. Now, I don't think it talks about cost in here, uh, but you can use a calculator and this is gonna be costly, right? It's gonna cost more to get faster and lower latency responses to your data. Now, if we come down here, you'll notice we have this Glacier tier. Now, if we went back to our resources, remember we talked about S3 Glacier, I was gonna mention that. Well, you can use these different glaciers, which allows you to store it for long periods of time at a much lower cost, but it stores it a little bit differently. This one specifically is instant retrieval. It's very similar to almost standard, but you're kind of storing it for a long, long time. You may not need it for 10 years, but when you do need it, you need it right away, uh, which is not a lot of use cases if you're using Glacier. But then you have something like Glacier Deep Archive. This is long-lived 
archive data access less than once a year with retrieval of hours. And so this is going to be data that you don't need it right away. Uh, you just want to be able to store it and have the security of putting it in the cloud. But you may not use that for years. And when you do need it, you know, you're just you're OK with waiting a little bit. It's going to cost almost nothing to store. It's a very, very, very little. And oftentimes, if you're doing something like this, you may even put backups of databases. You may put backups of entire code bases in here, things that you may never use again. Um, and there's lots of different use cases as well. So I just wanted to walk through that with this file. We're going to do standard. And on the next file we do, we're going to do Glacier Deep Archive and just look at the difference here. Now let's come down. Uh, we don't need encryption. We don't need any type of checksums, tags, or metadata. That stuff is almost uh, never used or very, very infrequently. So we've uploaded this file. Let's go ahead and go to our destination. You can see that now we have an object in our bucket, which is fantastic. You can even come over here and you can see the storage class is standard. Now let's go in. We're going to upload one more, but now we're going to upload it as a different storage class. So let's go to upload. Let's go to add files. Let's go to healthcare data two. We're going to open that up. The only thing we're going to change is now we're going to go down to the deep archive and we're going to go ahead and upload this easy peasy. And there we have two files. Now we have one in standard, one in Glacier deep archive. Let's go into the first one. If we want to use this in any way, it's almost instantly retrievable. We can download this. Uh, we have a bunch of ob object options, so we can download it. We can copy it. We can move it. We can change the storage class. We can do a bunch of different things, but let's come back and we're going to go to that file too. Let's go ahead in here. Notice right here, we're getting a totally different uh, message. It says the object is stored in Glacier Deep Archive storage class. In order to access it, you must first restore it. So you have to initiate a restore right over here and it can take 30 minutes to several hours. Notice we cannot download this. We also can't really do anything with it until we actually initiate that restore and it is restored for us to be able to access it. And so that's just something that I think is worth noting about storing things in S3. There are different storage classes depending on your use case and what you're using that data for. And of course you should look at the S3 pricing for both of these, because this one is going to cost more than this one. Now, there are costs associated with restoring it, but if you're restoring it once per year or maybe once every five years, it's going to be significantly less than your standard storage class. Now, this is kind of the meat and potatoes of using S3. Of course, you can create folders and subfolders. And in fact, when we get into some other lessons, especially things like glue, uh, having folders, subfolders, and different things like that is actually really important because we have something called a glue crawler. And it'll crawl through your folders and subfolders and retrieve certain data. And so having a folder structure actually becomes more important in those lessons. But we'll, of course, get to that when we actually start looking at it. One other thing to mention, and this is just uh, kind of a neat addition that they have in here. If we go into this file, we go down to query with S3 select. You can access this data and take a look at it. And so uh, let's say we have uh, our CSV here. It's comma separated. We can query this data using SQL. And so let's just run this with the limit five on there. We'll run our SQL query. We have our query results right down here. We can have it formatted and it looks like a little table. So we can come in here and we can look at uh, this data down here and just see what's in there. And so that might be useful to you. Now, in the next lesson that we're going to be having, we're going to use Amazon Athena, which is basically a tool to query off of S3 buckets. That's its primary use. And so most of the time, I honestly am not using this almost ever. But you can even see right here, uh, it says Amazon Athena. That's what we're going to be looking at in the next lesson. We'll be seeing how Amazon Athena works, how you can query data, kind of set up a pseudo database-like structure. I'll talk about the pros and cons of Amazon Athena versus other tools, because Amazon Athena is not for every use case. So I hope that that was helpful. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have not, I have a full AWS and Azure course on analystbuilder.com. Be sure to check it out. If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe below. And I will see you in the next video.